Okay, so now we will demonstrate on the fairings. If you look at the fairings, the, the three subdivisions of the fairings you can look at. So, this is the nasal cavity and behind nasal cavity you can see the nasopharynx. So, if you are asked that from where to where is the nasopharynx. So, this is the base of the skull spinoid bone. So, uh, from the base of the skull until the epiglot uh, until the lower aspect of the soft palate this is called uvula. So, from the base of the skull until uvula is your nasopharynx and you can see the opening of the auditory tube over here. Then uh, comes the oropharynx which is between the soft palate uh, uvula to the epiglottis. This oropharynx actually is the uh, part of the pharynx which deals with both the air which is coming through the nasopharynx as well as the food which is coming through the oropharynx. So, if you if you can see that clinically which part of the pharynx is most important where actually uh, uh, admixture of both the tract can happen is the oropharynx because it is transmitting the air from the nasopharynx as well as food from the oral cavity. So, what actually constitutes the oropharynx from the uvula until the epiglottis. So, what is there in the inside the oropharynx on the lateral wall of the oropharynx is the tonsil. So, there are two arch palate to tongue palatoglossal arch and palate to pharynx palatopharyngeal arch. In between palatoglossal and palatopharyngeal arch we can find the palatine tonsil and laryngopharynx is the last part uh, which actually enters into the uh, esophagus. So, in between the laryngopharynx and esophagus is the upper esophageal sphincter. So, laryngopharynx where it is starting? It is starting from the epiglottis and where it is ending this is cricoid cartilage. So, at the lower border of the cricoid cartilage the laryngopharynx continues into esophagus. So, although I have explained in your semester 1 lecture that what are the things which is happening when the food is entering into the oral cavity. So, the again uh, uh, just uh, remember what are the two things happening. Number 1 the soft palate become vertical. Uh, so, he, here it is becoming totally uh, there are two muscle here tensor palati and levator palati. So, tensor palati tenses it and levator palati elevate it. So, that the soft palate become completely obscure this uh, opening the isthmus. So, that the food cannot go into nasopharynx. Second thing happening is that larynx is moved up and epiglottis goes down. So, this is the laryngeal inlet. So, you can see the epiglottis, the airy epiglottic fold, the retinoid cartilage. So, th once this laryngeal inlet is closed, then food cannot go into the laryngeal inlet. So, it goes to the laryngopharynx and it goes into the esophagus. So, please note that these two mechanisms are very much important so that the food cannot go into the air tract. So, for example, uh, the children who suffer from uh, a deficiency in the palate, you know that there is a uh, congenital deformity which is called the uh, cleft palate. So, in case of cleft palate, the, 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 the newborn baby cannot actually move the palate. So, naturally the food will go into the nasopharynx and from there it will come through the air tract and entering into the larynx causing asphyxia. Uh, aspiration of the food inside the lung. Similarly, any uh, palatal palsy also can produce the same thing. Neuromuscular incoordination in this area in old age can also produce aspiration of, of water or food inside the laryngeal cavity. So, uh, uh, this is about the three subdivisions of the uh, pharynx. Next, we will go to the uh, Waldeyer's ring. So, if you look at it here that nasopharyngeal tonsil, the palatine tonsil on each side, the tonsil around the opening of the auditory tube and the limb node on the posterior aspect of the tongue. So, lingual tonsil on the posterior aspect of tongue, palatine tonsil, tubal tonsil around the opening of the uh, auditory tube and nasopharyngeal tonsil together they form Waldeyer's ring. And this Waldeyer's ring is a primary line of defense. Uh, so, uh, this, this gives defense not only to the respiratory tract also to the GI tract. Another important thing I want to highlight here is that on each side of the laryngopharynx here. So, this is laryngopharynx. So, this is the 
epiglottis, this is very epiglottic fold. So, on lateral aspect of laryngopharynx, there is a fossa and this is called pyriform fossa. And this pyriform fossa is very important why? Suppose uh, you are going to a Chinese restaurant and you are eating fish and all. So, fish bone when they struck, usually there is a only one area fish bone can struck and that is here in the pyriform fossa. So, pyriform fossa gives some uh, space on the lateral aspect of the uh, laryngopharynx. So, when the fish bone struck there, particularly in children or why they cry, why it is painful. Remember that this area is richly innervated by internal laryngeal nerve and it actually can initiate calf reflex also. So, uh, pyriform fossa is a very important component of laryngopharynx. Okay. Next we go to the muscles of the pharynx. If you look at the muscles of the pharynx, there are mainly three circular muscle, superior constrictor, middle constrictor and inferior constrictor. If, if you remain it like this, there are actually three flower tub. So, middle inferior constrictor is bigger, middle constrictor is intermediate in size and superior constrictor is the smallest size. But although I told flower tub, look at this diagram, posteriorly they form a common line fibrous raphe, but anteriorly the superior constrictor actually attached to the sphenoid bone, middle constrictor attached to the hyoid bone and inferior constrictor is very important. As I have written here, inferior constrictor has two part, one is thyropharyngeus part, another is cricopharyngeus part. One part attached to the thyroid cartilage here, another part attached to the cricopharyngeus. So, this cricopharyngeus part, just now we showed you here that there is a splinter. I told you that there is a splinter here. This is called upper esophageal splinter. So, this upper esophageal splinter is a splinter between pharynx and esophagus. What does it do? It does not allow regurgitation of food which has come into esophagus to go back into the pharynx. So, this part is mainly produced by this cricopharyngeus muscle. So, this cricopharyngeus muscle produce the circular muscle which produce the main splinter. And remember that all these muscles of the pharynx, they are innervated by the vagus nerve. Vagus nerve, 10th cranial nerve, 11th cranial nerve. So, neuromuscular incoordination of the upper esophageal splinter can actually produce dysphagia in elderly. And remember that there is some exception. So, particularly for assessment purpose, remember one of the important thing is that stylopharyngeus is one of the muscle. You have seen that there are some vertical muscle, palatopharyngeus, silopharyngeus and salpingopharyngeus. All the muscles are innervated by the vagus nerve, only one exception, stylopharyngeus, which is supplied by the ninth nerve. So, uh, remember that innervation of the upper esophageal splinter is of clinical importance because of dysphagia. Now, you go to one of the important thing, when you go to the uh, clinical skills, sometimes you have to learn this concept, particularly some other school give a very important uh, task of the students, because when you go to the clinical on, uh, pic picture of a patient being operated, before operation you usually do anesthesia. So, during anesthesia, there is a uh, instrument which is called endotracheal tube and this endotracheal tube actually is pushed into the larynx and then trachea so that the, uh, the air passage is clear. So, when you put the endotracheal tube in, in a simulated situation in CSSC, you must do two maneuver. One, you have to extend head at the atlanto occipital joint over here and you have to flex at the lower part of the cervical spine. Why is it so? I already showed you the relationship between laryngopharynx and larynx. If you do not bend it, your tip of the tube will not go to the larynx, it will go to laryngopharynx, but we do not want. We do not want air to go inside the uh, laryngopharynx and esophagus, we want to go to lung. So, this maneuver is very important, so that the tip of the tube go to larynx. Another important thing, I already told you inferior. Uh, part of the inferior constrictor. So, between thyropharyngeus and cricopharyngeus there is a gap and this gap sometimes can produce uh, some uh, problem in difficulty in swallowing because there may be diverticulum over here. So, this gap is usually called Killian's dehiscence and Killian's dehiscence uh, is particularly present in elderly pe people and it actually can produce a diverticulum or sac producing dysphagia. So, now coming to the esophagus, you know 
What about what about uh, the main important thing about esophagus is that uh, if you can see here in this diagram that esophagus is lying in the neck, it is lying in the thorax and then it is piercing the diaphragm entering into abdomen. So, we have got uh, cervical part, we have got thoracic part and we have got abdominal part. So, cervical part naturally is behind trachea and you may ask me okay, why uh, esophagus is not compressed in the neck. The main reason is that although trachea looks like a hard structure, but on the posterior surface of the trachea here there is a muscle called trachealis muscle which does not allow the trachea to compress on the esophagus. So, that is the main important in the cervical region. In the thoracic region one of the important things students are sometimes asked this is the esophagus, but what structure is lying in front of the esophagus? This chamber. So, this chamber is the left atrium. So, left atrium is dilated in mitral stenosis. So, mitral stenosis causes dilatation of the left atrium and this left atrium can compress over the esophagus causing difficulty in swallowing. So, this is a very important relationship between left atrium and esophagus. Not only that in aortic aneurysm as it is crossed by the arch of the aorta esophagus may be compressed. And the last part no doubt a very important thing is it is piercing the esophageal orifice at T10 and entering into abdominal part. Now, if you look at now the uh, uh, esophageal uh, part in the swallowing first and second stage of swallowing, if you look at first stage of swallowing inside the oral cavity it is voluntary. Second and third stage which is happening in pharynx and esophagus is involuntary. So, if you look at the muscular component the lower one third of the esophagus is actually smooth muscle involuntary. So, lower part of the uh, uh, swallowing is completely involuntary, whereas upper third it is skeletal and middle third it is a mixture. So, it does indicate that upper esophageal splinter in the upper part of the esophagus actually it is voluntary because thyropharyngeus, cricopharyngeus, infraconstrictor these are skeletal muscle, but esophageal muscle in the lower part they are involuntary. So, lower esophageal splinter. I, I just told you that esophagus has a very important component questions are asked on gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD. So, look at this that esophageal lower end of esophagus is becoming narrow and it is piercing the diaphragm here. Suddenly, the stomach is becoming big. So, sudden, sudden uh, enlargement of the stomach in the fundus produces some pressure difference. So, positive intra abdominal pressure or positive intragastric pressure and esophageal pressure become low. So, this change in the pressure between the stomach and the esophagus make the lower esophageal splinter close. So, that is why lower esophageal splinter is uh, called as a physiological splinter. No doubt there is some anatomical part also here remember the right cross of the diaphragm is some sling fibers to the esophageal wall. So, that can actually produce a pinch cock action and this part particularly it is very important for you to note particularly if you are asked clinical question on gastroesophageal reflux disease. So, in which condition acid from esophagus will go uh, acid from stomach will go to the esophagus, acid from stomach will go to the esophagus normally it is not possible. Normally physiological uh, action of the lower esophageal splinter does not allow. But if this mechanism in any how due to your physical condition or any other does not properly uh, take place, then acid from the stomach will regurgitate into the esophagus causing burning of the esophagus and patient will feel uh, pain behind the sternum. Now, coming to the blood supply of the esophagus, I told you about pota systemic anastomosis. So, if you see in the upper part in the cervical part inferior thyroid artery in the thoracic part it is supplied from descending thoracic aorta naturally, but the main important thing is about the abdominal part. So, in the abdominal part uh, the, there is a artery from the stomach which is called left gastric artery which is supplying the lower end of the esophagus, but more important is the venous part. As you have seen here I have written at porta systemic anastomosis, what is that? In the lower end of the esophagus there are veins which are going to the liver. They, they constitute portal vein. There are veins which are going to systemic vein like superior inferior vena cava, they are called systemic vein. So, in the submucosa of the lower end of the esophagus, there are anastomosis between portal vein and systemic vein. 
these are called porta systemic venous anastomosis. So, if the blood does not cannot go into the portal vein naturally there is backflow of blood and that produce enlarged porta systemic anastomotic vein over the lower end of the esophagus. This enlarged porta systemic anastomotic vein in the submucosa of the esophagus are called esophageal varices. So, this is particularly found in cirrhosis of liver with portal hypertension and the patient can produce hematemesis or bleeding through the mouth because this esophageal varices may rupture. Now, coming to the nerve supply, you all know that regarding nerve supply there are sympathetic nerve and parasympathetic nerve. So, parasympathetic nerve coming from the vagus, right vagus and left vagus forming uh, left vagus forming anterior gastric nerve, right vagus forming posterior gastric nerve. Sympathetic is from the middle cervical ganglion and gutter splanctic nerve. And remember gutter splanctic nerve is the main sympathetic nerve carrying the pain from the esophagus. Now, coming to the constrictions, I already told you that constriction is important why? Because the gastro, gastroenterologist they put gastroscope uh, into the stomach and this gastroscope passes through the esophagus and esophagus has natural constriction. So, when gastroscope is passing through esophagus by the marking on gastroscope the, the physician should note where I can get uh, some uh, resistance. So, what are the areas? First of all the first uh, thing is at its origin at uh, C 6 that means 6 inches from the incisor teeth. So, it is already written on the gastroscope 6 inches from the incisor teeth you get the first constriction. The second constriction you are getting at the level of T 4 which is 10 inches from the mouth or incisor teeth. The third one where it is crossed by the left main bronchus. So, this is the uh, this is the bronchus. So, when it is crossed by the bronchus the third constriction. The fourth constriction is where it is actually getting appears at the diaphragm. So, any uh, physician who is doing the gastroscopy should be causes of this four constriction. Otherwise, uh, actually injury to the esophagus can happen. So, thereby the main important thing is about introducing surgical instrument into the esophagus and stricture can develop.